We welcome all of you this morning, those of you who are here in person, those of you who are here in body, and those of you who are here in spirit, if you're uh, at home or, or somewhere else and joining us virtually. Please uh, join me in the call to worship. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. And now stand and, and join together in hymn 247, Come, Thou Almighty King. join me in a word of prayer. Let us pray. Eternal God, open our eyes to see your hand at work in the splendor of creation and in the beauty of human life. Touched by your hand, the world is yours. This place is holy. We are people who are holy and set apart. Help us to cherish the gifts that surround us, to share our blessings with our sisters and brothers, and to experience the joy of life in your presence. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. To those who are called, Beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. The Lord be with you. And also with you. It is my great joy and privilege to welcome you to worship here at First Baptist Church of West Point. Those of you who are able to gather with us in person and those of you who are joining us online, I hope that you have prepared your hearts and minds to worship the living God this morning. And let's continue in that worship as we sing verses 1 and 2 of hymn number 484, Higher Ground. Please stand as we sing. Thank you. 
psalm today is Psalm 15, a psalm of David. O Lord, who shall sojourn in your tent? Who shall dwell on your holy hill? He who walks blamelessly and does what is right and speaks truth in his heart, who does not slander with his tongue and does no evil to his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against his friend, in whose eyes a vile person is despised, but who honors those who fear the Lord, who swears to his own hurt and does not change, who does not put out his money at interest and does not take a bribe against the innocent. He who does all these things shall never be moved. Now we have a somewhat new hymn, hymn 127, The King of Glory Comes, and it's going to be all verses, so please stand and join us. now are called a confession from Isaiah 1. Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes, cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, plead the widow's cause. In penitence, and in faith in the crucified and risen Lord Jesus Christ, let us confess our sins to God and to one another, first silently and then using a prayer of confession that I'll provide for us. Let us pray. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have refused to hear the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Sisters and brothers, hear now the good news of the gospel, also from Isaiah 1. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. 
through faith in Jesus Christ, I declare to you that our sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Hear now God's will for our lives as people who have been reminded of God's forgiveness of our sins. Let us also be reminded of his empowerment by the Holy Spirit to do what he requires of us. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be eaten by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Our hymn is hymn number 489. Maybe one a little bit more familiar. Lord, I want to be a Christian. Please stand as we sing all verses. to hear the word of God read, let us turn in reliance on the Holy Spirit in prayer to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, we do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from your mouth. Make us hungry for this heavenly food that it may nourish us today in the ways of eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. A reading from Paul's first epistle to the Corinthians, chapter 10, verses 23 to 33. Listen carefully, this is God's word. 
All things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. Eat whatever is sold in the meat market without raising question on the ground of conscience. For the earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof. If one of the unbelievers invites you to dinner, and you are d disposed to go, eat whatever is set before you without raising any question on the ground of conscience. But if someone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it for the sake of the one who informed you, and for the sake of conscience. I do not mean your conscience, for, but th his, for why should my liberty be determined by someone else's conscience? If I partake with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of that for which I give thanks? So, whatever you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God, just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many, that they may be saved. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Hear the gospel lesson from the Gospel of Matthew, the 21st chapter. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our scripture lesson is Psalm 24. Again, listen carefully. This is God's word. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord, and who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false, and does not swear deceitfully, he will receive a blessing from the Lord, and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts, he is the king of glory. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Would you join me again in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, 
by the blood of your Son, by his resurrection from the dead, by the Holy Spirit and present, present with us this morning, make us worthy to be in your presence that we may truly love our neighbor, that we may truly love you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Who is worthy to worship? I think we know, or certainly hope that we know, who is worthy of worship. The triune God, the triune God alone. And that's certainly our aim this morning, to worship the one true God, the maker of heaven and earth, the one who is incarnate in Jesus Christ, the redeemer of the whole world, the one who is the Holy Spirit, present here with us and with our sisters and brothers all around the world. But who is worthy to worship? Or maybe to phrase it another way, perhaps a better way, to make it a little bit clearer, who is worthy to be able to worship? This is a question that is at the heart of our psalm for this morning. It is itself a psalm of worship. It's a psalm that was used by worshipers at the temple. It's a psalm that's used by Christian worshipers today. It's a very popular call to worship used at the start of Sunday services. Its origins are rooted in worship. Like many of the psalms, we don't know exactly when or on what occasion it was written. So it's attributed to David. It might have been after one of David's great victories over the Canaanites, perhaps. Uh, maybe thinking back to 2 Samuel 6, when David moves the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem after he defeats the Philistines. But regardless of the specific time or place when it was written, it was certainly written, almost certainly written for an occasion of worship, of celebratory worship. And it was passed on to future generations of worshipers who would worship on Mount Zion, who would worship at the temple. But who is worthy to be able to worship? I don't think we fully grasp the miracle that takes place each and every Sunday when we gather for worship. Now, the difficulties of last year, the forced separation of one another for the good of our community, I hope, I hope have made us appreciate worship a bit more. And maybe in some way we have a deeper understanding of what a gift worship is for us. But too often, and frankly as, as freedom-loving Americans way too often, we understand worship as a right. And don't get me wrong here, in the civic public sense, that's absolutely true. We have the legal protection to gather here today. Thank God for that. I don't expect anyone to barge in through the doors this morning and tell us to disperse or to arrest us. That is a wonderful thing, and that's something that which we should be thankful for. But that's not what I'm talking about when I say we misunderstand worship when we understand it as a right. What I'm talking about is I'm talking about the nonchalance with which we often find ourselves standing before a holy God. What gives us, what do we think gives us the right to stand before this holy God and worship? When we enter somebody's house, sometimes when we enter our own house, we know well enough to take off our dirty, muddy shoes, especially after mom or dad has swept the house. But we don't understand, and maybe if I could be personal for a minute, if I'm honest, I don't understand how I can waltz in here Sunday after Sunday, stained by my own sinfulness, stained by my own evil, and stand before a holy God in whom there is not even a hint of sin 
or evil and expect to survive. As if, as if it's just my right to do so. And even, God help me, as if it's, oh, it's just a burden for me to do so and God should really be so proud of me that I got up out of bed and that I showed up for an hour on the weekend to worship. Maybe to put it a different way, frankly, I think it would be easier for me to get into a rocket ship and to fly to the very center of the sun and not be burned up and consumed than to stand in the presence of a holy God in this way. We could do better to remember Isaiah and his vision of the heavenly throne room where he can only manage to say, woe is me for I am lost. In other words, woe is me for I am done, I am finished, I am dead. For I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the people of unclean lips for my eyes have seen the King the Lord of hosts. And there's a reason. Even in the New Testament, there's a reason that almost always the first words that the angel says whenever they meet somebody, whenever they visit a human being is, hey, don't be afraid. I mean, we certainly think that the person may be spooked because, I mean, they saw an angel. And that really just doesn't happen every day. And Certainly there's something true about that. But what's going on that's deeper is that there's an understanding that they're standing before the presence of a holy God or at least a messenger of a holy God and that in that presence of holiness sin cannot exist. And if I am sinful, how can I exist standing before such a holy God? And yet here we are today. Here we are this morning doing just that. This God to whom the whole earth belongs as verse 1 of Psalm 24 tells us. And not only the earth but the people. The people are God's. You and me who actually call ourselves people of God but more than even us. Everyone, every single person on this planet, it is all God's. We are all God's because God created us, created the whole earth. Or as David describes us in this psalm, founded it, established it. The seas and the rivers David talked about aren't mentioned specifically because they just kind of sound nice or peaceful. They're meant to draw us back. They're meant to draw us back to Genesis 1 and God forming creation out of chaos and separating the waters from the waters. But they're also a rejection. They're a rejection of pagan Canaanite religion. They're a rejection of the gods of the river and of the sea. And if David's written this as a, some sort of, after some sort of victory over the Canaanites, it's an emphatic declaration that the God David serves is the one true God. And the enemies that have been defeated worship false gods. The rivers and the sea don't belong to the false gods, but to the Lord, to Yahweh, the one who made them. And it's this understanding of God as creator that prompts David to ask his question in that second, that middle section of the psalm, the one that begins in verse 3, which is a similar question to the one I've been asking you this morning. Who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? Who actually can go up and worship this one true God, the living God who made the seas and the rivers and all the earth and even those who would dare to worship him on his holy mountain? It's 
God is other, completely distinct from his own creation, then the people who worship this holy God, this distinct God, must be set apart themselves too. That's really what we, we're getting at, what we mean when we use the word holy. We mean, a pe- and, and when we mean a people who are holy, we mean a people who are set apart, who are distinct, who are saints. David answers this question in verses 4 to 6. Who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? He who has clean hands and a pure heart who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully, he will receive a blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. So we must ask, what does it mean to have clean hands and a pure heart? It means to not do evil, to not carry it out with our hands, both in the actual commission of evil acts and in the omission of doing what is good, avoiding, yes, actually causing harm, but also avoiding failing to do what is good to our neighbor. In Psalm 15, which we read earlier, it gives us some examples, and some of which which echo what is mentioned specifically in this psalm in Psalm 24. Psalm 15 tells us that he who walks blamelessly and does what is right and speaks the truth in his heart, who does not slander with his tongue and does no evil to his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against his friend, in whose eyes a vile person is despised, but who honors those who fear the Lord, who swears to his own heart and does not change, who does not put out his money at interest and does not take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things shall never be moved. And maybe, if we took an honest assessment of ourselves, we might think, on a good day, maybe I can avoid most of these. But David doesn't just stop with clean hands. Again, this is something that goes much deeper than that. As Jesus tells us in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. When we desire to worship God, that is a desire for us to see God. And while on a good day we might can avoid committing sins with our hands, maybe on a better day we might actually use our hands to help our neighbor and do what is right, Is there a single day where we are truly pure in heart? Is there a day when our intentions, our intentions are wholly pure and holy and righteous? I included Paul's passage from 1 Corinthians 10 today as one of our readings. In part because it's a passage in the New Testament that quotes this psalm, but also, and probably even more importantly, because it's a great example of what I think it means to be pure in heart. At stake in in 1 Corinthians 10 is uh, the issue of eating certain types of meat. The issue of eating meat that has been sacrificed to idols. And Paul says, in quoting our psalm for today, the earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof. And basically what he's saying is that this meat is not tainted because those gods to whom it was sacrificed, they aren't aren't real. Like everything else, this meat belongs to the one true God, the living God. But again, it goes deeper than that. 
Paul uses this passage to tell us that intentions matter, especially our intentions toward our neighbors and toward God. Just because we are free to do something doesn't mean it's a good thing for us to do. 